This is The Curious Gamer, a show about the culture, design, and joy of games. I'm Devin Pulaski. It's said that we know more about the surface of Earth's moon than we do about Earth's ocean floors. The beauty of the ocean, the parts we can see and traverse across, are easy to appreciate as much as the little known qualities of the ocean are easy to fear. This duality has a seductive draw. From the comfort of a beach or the safety of a boat, we can admire the ocean's spectacle, the brilliant blue and green hues of water, the serenity of the sound of rolling waves, the excitement of spotting a fish or other small creature, and the shimmering glaze of the setting sun cast upon horizons never fails to draw us in. But on the other side of the ocean's duality is the deep, primal fear it conjures within. How the water stretches into infinity, a vastness that feels as incomprehensible as outer space. The ocean is a place that requires advanced technology in order for us to simply traverse over it or to submerge ourselves within it, though frequently even our best technology can't save us from its perils. The ocean is full of life that terrifies us in its size, shape, and behavior. It's little wonder why we know more about the moon than the ocean. When I was young, like many children, I became quietly fascinated by the ocean's most popular denizens, the playfulness of dolphins and the gentle, mystifying nature of whales. It's hard not to fall in love with them from books and aquariums and on incredible deep sea documentaries. But there's one piece of media that immersed me in the wonder of the ocean more than anything else. It's a video game that I first played when I was five years old. One that's lured millions of people the world over to its captivating depiction of the ocean and those that dwell within it. This game is called Echo the Dolphin. Echo the Dolphin was released in 1992 for the Sega Genesis, known as the Sega Mega Drive outside the US. Sega had spent their time since the launch of the Genesis in 1989, slowly ramping up their AAA game titles to compete with Nintendo as the dominant game console. You could argue 1992 served as the turning point in this console war, helping to catch Sega up and briefly overtake Nintendo's dominance. Sega's star mascot was Sonic the Hedgehog, debuting the year before, and Sega put most of their chips on the release of Sonic the Hedgehog 2 in 1992. But Sega had plenty of other banner releases in this year, sports titles like Madden and Jordan vs. Bird, fighting games like Mortal Kombat and Streets of Rage 2, racing games like Turbo Outrun and Road Rash 2, games from licensed properties like Batman Returns and Alien 3, and of course, games with broad family appeal, starring charming cartoon characters like Mickey Mouse's World of Illusion and, most importantly, Sonic the Hedgehog 2. When you zoom out and examine these and other popular releases, you can start to draw broad conclusions about the state of video games as a whole in 1992. Games encapsulated the thrills of racing, fighting, playing sports, or inhabiting a popular character. Games were loud, fast, frantic, and violent. And games were marketed almost exclusively to men and boys, and carried all the assumptions that come with that. This moment was a culmination of the short history of video games thus far, and a crystallization of the mainstream public perception of what the entire medium of video games was. However misinformed or accurate that may have been at the time, this perception has rarely changed almost three decades later, regardless of how much games have evolved. But then, emerging from the sea of similarities that was 1992's core game offerings, there was Echo the Dolphin. When you first start Echo the Dolphin, 
There is no bombastic opening theme song. There's no explosion of the title screen logo. There's not even the iconic shouting of the Sega brand's name. Instead, you're treated to opening music that's like a warm, gentle wave of water and beautiful graphics rendering the natural beauty of the ocean. During the opening cutscene, the camera pans along the water and a pod of bottlenose dolphins appear, each taking turns playfully leaping out of the water. The camera stops and every dolphin exits the screen, save for one, the dolphin named Echo, who enjoys a few more moments of solitary play. The image fades to a full screen look of Echo. The pixel art is brimming with enough realism to convince nascent game observers at the time that they are staring at an actual photograph of a dolphin. Within seconds, Echo the Dolphin leaves an impression, one unlike any other video game at its time and honestly one that hasn't been made since, occurring before you even have agency over the titular dolphin. When you're finally in control, you're likely to realize how incredibly rare it is to play a character in a video game that is not human, or at least humanoid. As you start playing around with Echo's movements and the physics of swimming, you will unconsciously appreciate the level of care gone into simulating the experience of dolphin exploration. Echo's torso bends like a sine wave as he glides through the ocean depths. You can press a button to gain a burst of speed. Doing this at the surface of the water causes Echo to breach the waves and soar majestically through the air before returning down with a satisfying splash. It's easy to while away several minutes enjoying the sheer sensation of sublime simulated dolphin navigation. There are two main verbs in Echo, swimming and singing. Tapping a button causes Echo to sing, which produces a fittingly echoed sound, represented visually as a blue wave of energy emanating from Echo's body. Echo can sing to various creatures like his fellow dolphin podmates, and they'll respond back with their own songs, which shows on screen as text laid over realistic looking water. Echo's singing has another immediate utility to the player. If you hold down the sing button, the energy wave emitted by the song returns back to Echo, causing the screen to display a map of your immediate surroundings. This is an invaluable tool at Echo's disposal, one that is rooted in science, but we'll get back to that later. Echo's songs eventually grant him further powers beyond the mere exchange of information. It is here that the scientific aspects of the game give way to science fiction. You discover how Echo's songs can unlock pathways and secrets, how they are cast like projectiles and used to battle adversaries, and even how the vibrations of his voice can enable him to travel through time. The opening moments of Echo offer no obvious structure. As you swim to the far left, right, and bottom edges of the game world, you quickly encounter rocky walls and obstacles that bar your progression. You'll pass by fish and clams going about their business. And then there's your dolphin family pod. As you sing to them, they respond with what seems like benign information, but it's all information relevant to the game's core mechanics. One dolphin tells you that eating fish gives you strength, a nod to how fish can replenish your health bar. Another dolphin asks Echo, if we breathe there, why do we live beneath the waves? I venture this comment is meant to remind the player that Echo is in fact based on real life dolphins, mammals that require oxygen, meaning Echo will require it as well. At its onset, Echo the Dolphin appears to masquerade as a peaceful simulation of dolphin life. First-time players will likely spend several minutes exploring the small space of ocean you're confined to at the introduction, intuiting the nuances of Echo's movements. The closest semblance of an objective comes from one of your podmates, who poses the following question. How high in the sky can you fly? And yet, this simple challenge, however innocuous it might appear, ends up being a catalyst for a horrific tragedy. As you start to master operating Echo, it becomes clear that jumping out of the water is the most exciting maneuver. You recognize methods and patterns for building speed, and experiment with how to best build momentum to launch through the air. But eventually, you will perform a jump so high that it triggers this. For anyone who played Echo in the 90s, it's hard to forget this violent storm, which sucks up all life in the waters below, save for Echo, who plummets back into the water to find that his pod is gone. 
the upbeat mood of the music has descended into a haunting tune of dread. You're left in solitude and navigate Echo as he searches for his family. The game offers no explanation for the violence that has occurred and wordlessly beckons that you investigate its cause. Players soon discover that a few rocks that previously blocked a path forward were sucked up in the storm and you're now allowed to advance, thus propelling you into the adventure ahead. I'd like to dig into the game mechanics of Echo the Dolphin and how it's incredible what the designers were able to achieve, the vision they were able to execute, and the masterclass in game design they were able to demonstrate. These feats are all the more impressive given they were done in 1992. But I'd like to quickly recount what happens during Echo's journey and the fascinating mythos of its world. So first, there's the big storm that takes Echo's family away. Echo starts by exploring the nearby waters, eventually finding and conversing with an orca whale to get a tip on where to go next. Echo then explores deeper into the ocean, and along the way he encounters more dangers and occasionally assists other dolphins who have been separated from their families. Later, Echo braves icy waters to speak with a wise old whale known as Big Blue. Throughout Echo's travels, he dodges lethal jellyfish, brawls with sharks, and sneaks past malicious octopuses. These are only a few of the ocean's threats that exponentially increase over time. Echo finally encounters the oldest living being on Earth, known as the Asteroid, who relates that the cause of the violent storm is the Vortex, an alien race from another planet. It turns out that the Vortex make a quincentennial visit to Earth in order to harvest resources. Echo then travels to the city of Atlantis and sings to a machine, creating reverberations that allow him to travel through time. Echo swims through prehistoric waters, flies over mountains with the aid of a pteranodon dinosaur, gains new powers from the asteroid, returns to the present day, and triggers the storm once again, this time using it to confront the alien threat head on. Finally, Echo does battle with the Queen of the Vortex herself, a skirmish that terrifies in both its difficulty and with its visuals of the Queen's grotesque, horrific form. All the while, this epic tale is told with few words and expressed solely through the lens of a dolphin. It confounds me that a game with this premise and tone could exist at all, let alone exist in 1992 as a banner release for Sega. It is clear that this is a work of a special mind, and that vision belongs to Echo the Dolphin's creator, a man named Ed Annunziata. Ed has cited various works of science fiction as the foundation for Echo, but chief among them is a book called The Sounding, which is a fiction tale told from a sentient whale's perspective. In his research, Ed became fascinated with the concept of echolocation, the ability for sea mammals to gather and transport pictures and ideas using sound. The more Ed delved into the science of undersea life, the more he wanted to explore the notion that the ocean was one giant interconnected ecosystem with life that could talk to each other with its own language its own cultures and norms. Knowing this, it's easy to see why, in the game, Echo's ability to sing is arguably as important as his ability to swim. Communicating through song was a concept so beguiling to Ed Annunziata that it was grounds for him to incept a micro-universe for which to build a game around. However, as interesting or inspiring Ed's vision was when deconstructed down to its source materials, it brings me back to the question, how was this game made? How did Ed and his team win over the cynical business suits, looking to make yet another quick buck off of a cartoon mascot platformer game, or another game centered around guns, cars, and sports? Here is a man pitching a game about dolphins. And they weren't even cutesy, stylized dolphins with big, expressive eyes. A much easier sell, especially to the established audiences of video games. 
Instead, Ed's game featured a dolphin rendered with realistic likeness. Dolphins that are vulnerable to numerous ocean threats and have to breathe air to survive. Dolphins that are traveling through time and space to do battle with aliens. The development of Echo was far from easy for Ed, who worked with a team of talented artists and developers at a game studio called Novotrade. But thanks to the company's technical mastery of the Sega Genesis and their impressive early prototypes of Echo, the team managed to get their game its green light. But Ed's vision was nonetheless under threat along the way. He often mentions how people would suggest adding more humans in the game, such as adding people with fishing nets Echo could get stuck in, or scuba divers attacking Echo with harpoons. Most memorably, when Ed first pitched Echo the Dolphin to his boss at Sega, he was met with the following direct quote. Who wants to be a f***ing fish? This anecdote is pretty profound to me. Anyone who's a creative professional is intimately familiar with this moment. The moment where you've carefully sculpted a creative vision, story, or world. A vision that threads seemingly unrelated pieces and inspirations from a cascade of sources into a cohesive whole. A vision that is finally crystallized after dozens of hours of thoughtful consideration and is ready to share with others so that vision can be brought to life, only to have this moment of sharing to be one of friction, frustration, opposition. It's the brutal reality that most others won't accept this vision outright, especially if it's new and challenging. This is painful to accept and all the more wounding when the opposition is from your own team. Hearing the story of Echo and its journey from an idea to a flagship franchise for Sega inspires genuine awe. To many, Ed Annunziata was just another creative hippie type, inspired by too many science fiction books, comics, and LSD culture, and wanted to make a highfalutin, save the earth game about dolphins. He was attacked by people who thought only of money and maintaining the status quo, people who couldn't even conceive of a story where humans weren't at the center of it. Yet despite these deterring forces, Ed and Novatrade brought Echo to millions of people around the world and designed a game that is equal parts beauty to watch and listen to, but even more fascinating to play. The best video games of all time share in common the meticulous design of their introductions. That is to say, the best games teach players everything they need to know through the act of playing and not through heavy-handed exposition, and all of this occurs within the game's opening moments. Within minutes, Echo teaches you it is a game about exploration. It is about paying attention to your environment, to look for a path forward, to identify obstacles in your way, to utilize the tools and knowledge at your disposal, to take your time to learn new information, and it demands that you retain every bit of knowledge learned. Finally, it is a difficult, sometimes unforgiving game. But to me, the more impressive feat is that Echo was a game with something genuinely new to say and express. And I don't mean with the specifics of its sci-fi plot. I'm talking about what it has to convey about the real world, about the ocean, about not only the ocean's calm beauty, but its horrific violence. These notions are expressed through the marriage of its art and sound with meaningful game design. It is a game with high difficulty because life underwater is difficult, hostile, dangerous. It is a game with aliens from another planet because the developers wanted to declare that the deepest corners of the ocean feel like an alien planet, one that is wholly unlike the planet we as human beings interface with every day. And this haunting illustration of ocean life is depicted not only with some of the finest pixel art and beautifully composed music ever committed to a video game, but also by its game design. Echo the Dolphin isn't just a hard game, it's brutal. The further you get, the more it feels like everything wants to kill you. Your friends are few and offer little in the way of aid. Meanwhile, your enemies are copious and relentless. Game critics have oft commented that the reason Echo the Dolphin's popularity waned in the years since its initial release is because of its difficulty, 
Some even want the audacity to suggest that its difficulty is a crutch for lazy game design. These critics fail to intuit the genius of Echo. Echo's difficulty is good difficulty. It's good design. Let's take a look at an example from the first level of the game. After the storm, you find yourself in a similar situation as before. You're within waters surrounded by rocky walls to your left, right, and bottom. Using your echolocation ability, you can discover that there is more to see on your right, and also that the right rocky wall is far lower than the left. Since you learned how to jump very high in the last level, you're prepared to use this knowledge to scale the wall, though it may take you a few tries to finally do it. Upon completing this challenge, you have learned a valuable lesson, that if there is no visible path forward, try jumping. Next, you encounter swarms of jellyfish. Unlike your dolphin pod mates, singing to jellyfish does nothing. If you try to touch them, they'll sting you. Also, just listen to that sound. That, that sound plays whenever Echo gets hurt, and it's so unsettling. I always felt like that sound was effective because it's ambiguous. Is that the sound of Echo crying out in pain? Or is it that the sound of whatever's attacking you? Anyway, getting stung teaches you that one of the two bars at the top corner of your screen represents your current health. The more you're stung by jellyfish or hurt by other hazards, the more your health bar goes down. And if it fully depletes, Echo dies and the level restarts. So, you swim around some more and discover a series of underwater caves, as well as small rocky obstacles you need to jump over. Again, applying that lesson you just recently learned. Before long, you encounter another hazard, pieces of coral that are spiky and orange. This coral is deceptively similar looking to other coral you've already passed by that is harmless if you touch it. Touching the spiky coral hurts Echo, just like the jellyfish. This lesson teaches you that it's not only other creatures, but the environment itself that can be dangerous, and you must pay careful attention to small details in your surroundings at all times. Here's a final bit of fascinating game design I want to dive into. So again, Echo is a mammal and needs to breathe air. A bar showing your current oxygen is displayed at the top corner of the screen along with your health, which slowly depletes over time until you manage to jump out of water and get a breath of fresh air. The deeper you venture into the underwater caves, the fewer and farther between are the places where you can restore your oxygen. The levels in Echo are large interconnected mazes filled with numerous misdirections and complicated hazards. Forcing you to breathe to stay alive is the thread tying every hazard together, requiring players to make a mental map of the places they can breathe and to be ever mindful of when they will need to return there. It is also a clever implementation of risk versus reward. When you're low on oxygen, you'll often ask yourself questions like, should I risk going into a new area and hope there's a place to breathe? Or do I go back to get air and risk losing my way forward again? This is yet another masterstroke of design that marries the game's mechanics with its story and tone. Requiring the player to breathe air ensures that you are never able to cower from your enemies. You are always on the move, and thus always exposing yourself to danger. In Echo, a game about exploring, the act of exploration is rarely a peaceful endeavor. It is a frantic, violent, and desperate struggle to survive. It is the experience of life underwater, thoughtfully distilled into a Sega Genesis cartridge. I've only described a few of the lessons you learn in the first level of the game alone. Each passing level in Echo asks that you remember everything it has taught you in the levels prior. In games, steadily increasing difficulty while also providing just enough knowledge and experience to the player to tackle that increasing difficulty is a delicate dance that makes Echo the Dolphin a game with incredible craftsmanship. But while Echo is by no means the only game to do this, it is one of the first games to use its design as an expression of something other than the status quo. This game had something new to say. It has something intangible to express. 
These illustrations, depictions, and emotions are all about something from reality. About the water that covers more of our planet than anything else. About the creatures that dwell beneath these waves, and how they are brimming with life, culture, society, family, conflict. Things that are at once not unlike human beings, while also something altogether alien to us. Echo feels like an anti-power fantasy, spinning a tapestry of struggles for survival from the lens of a dolphin. And the final layer tying together this vision is how the game's world is wholly uninterested in the affairs of humans. The story even suggests that humans have been gone for so long that they are barely a memory. And the power of this message is amplified ever more thanks to thoughtful game design. If the game starred a human character, they would be able to collect things on this journey. They would have a backpack or some form of inventory to store objects. They would carry and use tools to traverse their environments and use weapons to battle their adversaries. Echo cannot carry a map, but he can use echolocation to understand the world. He cannot carry objects, but he can learn new songs and use them as tools. He cannot wield weapons, but he can use his own body and eventually his own voice to do battle. If the game told all this through words, it would be mildly interesting. Instead, Echo's game design allows players to wordlessly experience this firsthand, making it fascinating and memorable. Despite the lavish praise I offer Echo the Dolphin, I do empathize with game critics and game players and the mixed reception the game has received over the years. And I have to confess, I've never finished any of the Echo the Dolphin games without game-breaking assistance. When it comes to my favorite classic games, it's easy for me to play something like Sonic the Hedgehog 2 and Super Mario Bros. 3 and ease into them like a beloved album from my youth. In playing them, I unconsciously, breezily run through their levels at a state of total relaxation. I glide through what were once challenges, but are now fond, replayable memories. But in Echo the Dolphin, I cannot achieve the same state of zen beyond the first few stages. Many people incorrectly remember Echo as a chill, beautiful dolphin simulator. Either these people haven't seen the game beyond the first few levels because it was too hard for them, or they simply haven't seen the game in decades. The beautiful art, music, and other serene qualities of the game are all that remain in their minds, a testament to the strength and originality of those qualities of the game. But here's something many players who did grow up with Echo have said, that it's a game you could play in front of your mom, without fear of the usual scorn reserved for most games. It's a game that made people stop and ask questions. It's a game that helped start the tireless and tiring debate on whether or not video games are art. The reason for this is because, once again, Echo is a game that had something to say. Something, clearly, of genuine interest as it caused people across party lines to pay attention. It should be no secret why Echo achieved popularity far beyond the assumed young male audience of video games. Perhaps it's because the game was absent of the male power fantasies that were de facto at the time. Some critics have even likened Echo the Dolphin as a subtler alternative to the hand-wringing Save the Planet media that was prevalent throughout the 90s. Ed Annunziata, the game's creator, denies that an explicit environmental message was ever planned. He was thoroughly invested in exploring a story with dolphins as the sole protagonists, exploring how they are beings with lives that are just as interesting, if not more so, than our own. Echo the Dolphin is, at once, a chill simulation of the ocean as well as a violent depiction of the sea. It's a pro-environmental illustration and a celebration of sentient water-based mammals. Echo, being a work of art, is all of these things and more. To me personally, it is most strikingly about the celebration of fascinating mammals that have survived the harsh realities of our planet for far longer than we have and will likely survive much longer provided we don't kill them first. I have one last thing to share today. During many episodes of my show, I have posited that video games are a great catalyst for creativity, and I'd like to take this opportunity to share a personal example of this. Earlier, I mentioned how at one point during the game, 
Echo meets something known as the Big Blue. This is one of those goosebump moments in games that I will never forget. After traveling through impossibly difficult Arctic waters, Echo swims to a safe space. Suddenly, you are met by a creature, a blue whale, so massive that it dwarfs you by comparison, that you cannot even see its entire body on screen and must swim far to the left to uncover it all. Reinforcing its size is its deep, bellowing call. Echo the Dolphin may have endeared me to the sheer intelligence, playfulness, and capabilities that dolphins possess in the real world, but the deepest impression this game left on my mind was the majesty of whales. You spend much of the game interfacing with creatures that are either smaller than you, about your size, or are about a few times larger than you. But encountering the Big Blue is a moment that humbles you. You revel in its scale. You respect its old age and vast wisdom. And so, throughout the rest of my life, questions and daydreams about whales lingered in the back of my mind, thanks to the Big Blue. Which brings me to today. I regularly embark on projects outside of my usual work, and one such project is The Curious Gamer. But there is another audio project I've worked on for years now. It's a cinematic audio story called The Moonfish, a fantasy tale following three women and a young man as they travel the country. The story takes cues from things like The Lord of the Rings, Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, and naturally has many nods to my favorite video games, most prominently the Legend of Zelda series. But as I was starting to plan my story, I wanted it to have its own mythology and old stories that were passed down throughout generations. And I wanted these stories to feel like something greater than the people dwelling on the planet, something older, wiser, and more powerful and evocative than traditional tales about gods and titans. And I thought these mythological tales would be an interesting way to open each new episode of my show. I'd like to play for you the opening of The Moonfish, which tells the myth of how the world was born. A myth inspired by the stories of Echo the Dolphin. Here we go. This is The Moonfish. Chapter 1. Bell Aquin. Some say that staring at the stars is like gazing out at the ocean. You never know when something will swim by. Before the land and the infinite ocean, before all life on this planet, before the planet itself, there were great leviathans that traveled through space. These beings had gargantuan silver-blue bodies, and they floated past planets and stars, propelled by their flukes, flippers, and fins. Stories and songs of these whales are etched into history, how they sailed through space like it was a grand ocean. Each whale was seeking the deepest corners of the galaxy, places where life could flourish, water could flow, and music could play. In days past, in a language no longer spoken, these whales were called the Shenlan. But today, those of us who still remember the whales call them the Moonfish. A single moonfish gave birth to our world. It sang as it sailed the sea of space. Its lone voice contained a thousand instruments. The melodies it sung became harmonies. The harmonies became infinities. Soon, rocks, debris, and matter drifting through space became trapped in the music of the moonfish. The debris swirled within the tug of gravity. Soon, it was forged into a pearl orb. The moonfish swam round the pearl, singing 1,000 songs for 1,000 years. Each melody bathed the pearl in dancing flame. The pearl swelled, its surface now coarse with stone and mineral. 
Water soon sprang from the pearl's core, birthing streams, lakes, and oceans. Soon the moonfish's songs created seeds. The seeds scattered across continents and oceans. Each seed contained instincts, memories, emotions, and lessons. All that is needed for life to flourish. From this whale, this single being, came an orchestra. One which composed an entire planet from nothingness. And on the final day, the moonfish sang a song that created the moon. Here inside its lunar sanctuary, the weary giant rests and watches over the planet it had spent a millennium conducting. The last note sung by the moonfish was the name of our new world, Sonade. And so, the next time you see the moon, you may be staring into the eyes of the moonfish. That's because some of us still believe that, to this day, it continues to look upon us, observing and guiding Sonade through both hardship and prosperity. Lost in this world, crippled by uncertainty and trapped in the darkness of fear, look up and listen. The melodies of the moonfish will light your way. I've been working on and off on the moonfish for years now. So far, I've written almost all seven episodes of the planned first season of the show. I've also recorded, edited, sound designed, and composed the original music for the first two episodes. Since restarting The Curious Gamer about a year ago, my efforts have shifted away from the Moonfish, but I'd like to return back this year and finally release the first season. In the meantime, if you'd like to listen to the entire first episode of The Moonfish, or if you'd like to listen to the first season when it's finally released, you can actually do so right now. Just go to themoon.fish. Yeah, .fish is an actual subdomain. There you can subscribe to the show as a podcast anywhere you find podcasts. Anyways, I didn't just want to share the Moonfish to shamelessly plug yet another work of mine. I'm sharing because it's tied to the strong feeling I have about games like Echo the Dolphin. Games can impress themselves deeply on our minds and imaginations. As a child, playing Echo the Dolphin couldn't supplement the knowledge I gained from books and films about the ocean. But the game did have a power unlike any other media, and it transported me most directly into the more intangible qualities of the ocean and its beautiful forms of life. I'm not alone in hoping that Echo the Dolphin will return someday. After the release of the first game, Ed and his team went on to create a sequel, Echo the Dolphin, The Tides of Time, which refined the game mechanics, art, and music established in the first game. Then, the next true entry in the series would be its last in the year 2000 for the Sega Dreamcast, called Echo the Dolphin, Defender of the Future. While the game brought Echo into the burgeoning world of 3D, the game was absent of Ed Annunziata and his team at Novatrade, and thus the game lost much of its soul and spirit and there have been no new entries in the series now over two decades later. Ed Annunziata continues to fight for the return of his beloved franchise, both with spiritual successors as well as with battles to secure rights to the original property. No one knows what the future holds for Echo, but the legacy of the original game should forever cast an important lesson to the entire video game industry. And that lesson is that there are many powerful stories, ideas, and expressions waiting to be told through game design. Echo brought the ocean, its beauty, and its horrific nature to our living rooms. It's the first game ever to truly do so, and stands as one of the only games to do so still. It accomplished this at a time when most video games borrowed from a shallow handful of concepts and achieved a vision with primitive means compared to what we can achieve today. What other big, important ideas about our real world are left unexpressed through games? And what minds will bring those ideas to life? For those looking for guidance, Echo the Dolphin is a lodestone, still rife 
with discoveries now almost three decades later. Lessons I believe will stand the test of time. The Curious Gamer is written, produced, and voiced by me, Devin Pulaski. I also compose the original music for my show. The music of the original Echo the Dolphin games on the Sega Genesis and Sega CD was composed by the brilliant Spencer Nielsen. A fun fact I didn't mention in the regular episode is that Ed and Spencer were heavily influenced by Pink Floyd, and even some of the songs in Echo are named after Pink Floyd's songs. And honestly, there's a lot of other cool stories about Echo's development if you take a look at some of the pieces written about it, so I highly suggest going down a little Googling rabbit hole. Please hit the subscribe button for my show on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. And you can watch and listen to my show on YouTube and Instagram. And once again, you can also do the same for my other show, The Moonfish, which you can find at themoon.fish. So it really helps the show out if you could leave a five-star review or share the show with a friend who you think would be interested. You can do this and learn more about the show at thecuriousgamer.org. And if you're looking for a game to play right now, you can write to me using the built-in message forum on my website, and I'll respond with a recommendation tailored to you. Thank you for listening. And remember this, no matter what you're doing, whether you're feeling up or down, you're never too old to enjoy your life and play.